This is the day the Lord has made. Come on, if you're really grateful. Come on, let's bless the Lord in the house today. I guess y'all must not be too grateful. Well, I'm grateful, so I bless the Lord all by myself. If the Lord has been good to you, and he sustained you, and he's kept you, and you are grateful for him doing so. Come on, let's bless the Lord in the house today and say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and thank you for your mercy, and thank you for your peace, and thank you for your joy. marvelous gift of your son Jesus the Christ who is both Savior and Lord today thank you for the reminder took from your song to be grateful for all you've done for us thank you Lord you've been mighty good to us you've been better to us than we could ever be to ourselves and so this morning we come declaring that we are grateful for all you've done now Lord now, Lord, we ask that you would touch our hearts now, touch our minds to receive a word from you on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, one more time. Let's just bless that wonderful name of Jesus. This morning, I want to bring one more concluding message. So this marvelous series we started about three or four or five weeks ago Hallelujah. entitled do I really need a pastor Amen. every week we have raised that question in our hearing to consider what are the benefits of having a pastor hopefully by the time this series is over all of us will have the same pastor the same answer to say yes we, we do need a pastor this morning I want to swing from a different angle of vision and I want to look at the pastor this morning as a wounded healer. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. One of the paramount passages that Paul, the preaching pastor, writes to his up-and-coming young upstart <laughs> named Timothy. And in these six or seven verses, he gives to us another reason that we all really do need a pastor. Amen. 2 Timothy Chapter 4, beginning at verse number 2. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse number 2. I ask you, as I do every Sunday morning, if you're able to stand, that you would in reverence to God's word. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse number 2. If you found it, say, who? There it is. If you don't have it, say, hold on. Good, we're all there. Let's read together. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse number 2. <clears throat> Preach the word. Be ready in season right. and out of season. Amen. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come and has now come when they will not be able to endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have ears that's itching. They will heap up for themselves teachers. Okay. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. Uh -oh. Verse number five. But you be watchful in all things. Yes. Endure afflictions. Do the work of the evangelist. Yeah. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. Yes, yes. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. But not just to me, to all those who love his appearing. I want to spend most of my time on verse number six. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. This morning, before you take your seat, I want to tag this text. The pastor as God's wounded healer. You may be seated. If you're visiting with us today, your neighbor should have tapped you on the shoulder and told you that whatever you do, please 
There you go. Don't close your Bible. All right. Because our pastor is going to spend the entirety of his message, and everything he says oh, is going to come right from the Word of God. If you got it on your phone, don't, don't close your phone. Everything that I'm going to say this morning comes right from the text. Thank you, Jesus. The pastor, as God's wounded healer, uh -huh. Ben Carson was born in 1951. I know. He was born in the streets and the ghettos of Chicago, Illinois. He grew up with many anger management issues and problems. As he grew up in that inner city neighborhood ghetto community, he always had struggles because of his inter anger issues. He would have fits of rage. And one time he even almost assaulted his mother and his best friend. But as he grew up in that inner city community, All right. throughout the course of his life, he used his inter anger struggles to fuel him and motivate him to achieve success. In 1973, he would graduate from Yale University as a neurosurgeon and become one of the famous neurosurgeons in this country. His fame and fortune was catapulted by him being known as the neurosurgeon who could perform twin separating neurosurgery. He would often find twins who were conjoined in their body parts and could perform neurosurgery that could separate these twins. He traveled all over the world doing this, South Africa, India, and Asia. And over time, he became known for the man who knew how to perform successful neurosurgery to conjoin twins. But what they did not know was right. that his motivation for his success always came from his inner struggle with his anger and his depression. And it was his inner struggle his inner afflictions that motivated him to become the one who could heal so many people. He himself suffered and was in need of healing. And as he was in need of healing, he used his wounds to heal somebody else. That's the embodiment of what the idea of a wounded healer is. It's someone who is called to be an agent of healing. But many times they are wounded or in our need of healing themselves. That's what Henry Nowen talks about in his book, The Wounded Healer. He says that the pastor, in many cases, is called to be a wounded healer. In other words, he's called to be an agent to bring healing to others. And oftentimes it's the case that the pastor who's called to be an agent of healing oftentimes is wounded and in need of healing themselves. And so the idea of this paradox of a wounded healer is someone who heals, but at the same time is in need of healing. And so Jesus Christ is the perfect embodiment of the ultimate wounded healer. And this morning, if you miss everything else I have to say, please don't miss this sermon in a sentence. And it is that God heals the pastor, the wounded healer, to be able to heal those who are in need of healing. As Christ was the wounded healer and pours him like his life out into me, then I'm able to pour my life out into you. All right. There are four things this text shows us. I'll give them to you and I'll take my seat this morning. On the one hand, the pastor, the wounded healer, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, is called to preach the word in every season. You didn't close your Bible, did you? I know you didn't do that. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. There are five imperatives that Paul gives to his young upstart Timothy who desires to be the pastor of the church there. Five commands that he gives to him with a military forceful mood almost like a military general would command his subordinates. He gives five imperatives. But he begins with the first command to preach the word. If you've been around this church long enough, you've heard me talk about the doctrine of first mention. That if there's a list or a progression of things in a list, that oftentimes the first thing that's mentioned is the most significant and important in that list. And so the first thing he tells Timothy is preach the word. And that first imperative actually is the basis for everything else he tells him in the next few verses. 
He says you got to preach the word. And you've got to be instant, in season, and out of season. Two beautiful words in the Greek, A.K. Ross and U.K. Ross. It means that you've got to preach the word. Yeah. And you've got to press it home on all occasions. You've got to stand up for what you believe in, stick to it when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. He says, preach the word. In season all right. and out of season. If that be the case, then Paul is telling Timothy that you ought to stick with the task of preaching the word. Whether you want to or not. I guess he's trying to tell Timothy that one of these days, if you keep on preaching, there's going to be a day when you're not going to feel like preaching. All right. And you're going to have to preach even though you don't feel like preaching. I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. Uh, that day has not come for me yet. Uh, I guess I'm just getting started because uh, I always want to preach. I, I, I love to take God's word. Allow him to breathe on his word. And then breathe on me and I stand up and breathe on you. I, I just, I love to preach. I love to take heavy theological concepts and lay them in your laps in a way that you can understand. I, I love to preach the word of God. It, it ain't happened for me yet. Maybe it will down the line when I get older, but it ain't happened yet to where I ain't felt like preaching every Sunday morning. Every Monday morning, every Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning. I just love to preach the word. Matter of fact, there's nothing else I love to do more than preaching the word of God. Nothing else even comes close to be preaching. Well, let me not speak too fast. Uh, All right. There is a there is a close second. But uh, I don't want to put Sister Hutchinson on blast like that, so I ain't gonna tell y'all. But he says preach. In season and out of season. Preach when you feel like it and when you don't. Because what happens is that there are all different types of seasons that come into your life. And the pastor, the wounded healer, has to preach you through every season that you experience. He says preach it in season and out of season. One thing about seasons, they always change. You're going to pray with me this morning, right? And so when he says preach in season and out of season, he paints this image that there are varying kinds of seasons that all of us will have to experience in life. But at every season, you need a preacher, a pastor, a wounded healer to preach you through whatever season of life you're in. And one thing about life, you, you can control whatever you want in your life. You, you can control what you do, yeah. when you do it, how you do it, who you do it with, how often you do it. You can control whether you go to church, read your Bible, pray. You can control all of that. But one thing you can't control is the weather. And when the weather changes and the seasons change, you need a pastor, preacher, a wounded healer to preach you through all of the seasons. Nicholas Saint. A famous world renowned sculptor and painter. And in 1560, he painted these four seasons that now reside in the Louvre in Paris. In the Versailles room, he paints from the picture of four Old Testament stories the varying seasons of life. He paints how there's always a change in the seasons. For winter, he points and paints the season of Noah and the great flood in Genesis. Yeah. For spring, he paints Adam and Eve bouncing around the Garden of Eden in a springtime fire. For summer, he paints the picture of Ruth laying at the feet of Boaz. For fall, he paints the picture of the spies who go over to the land to survey the land and they find great luscious grapes. And in that painting, he shows all of us that there are all types of seasons that you'll have to endure in your life. And I want to ask you a question this morning. What season of life are you in? Think about it. Are you in the winter? Are you in the spring? Are you in the summer? Or are you in the fall? The pastor, the preacher, the wounded healer has to preach you through every season of your life's existential experience. On the one hand, somebody here today, you're in the winter season. Stay with me, I want to help you this morning. You're in the 
winter season. And, and you know the winter season is a, is a stormy season. Pastor preacher has to preach you through the storms of this life. That's what he means when he says preaching in season and out of season. Everybody goes through storms. The old preacher used to say you're either in a storm right now, just coming out of a storm. You may not know it, but you might be head first on your way into a storm. Everybody experiences storms. I'm glad the saints helped us deal with storms. They would say, like a ship that's tossed and driven, battered by an angry sea, when the storms of life are raging and the billows fall on me. I wonder what I have done to make this race so hard to run. But I say to my soul, take courage. The Lord will make a way somehow. And when you're in the stormy season, you need the wounded healer to remind you that the Lord will make a way somehow. So the storms come in in the winter season. Pastor has to preach you through the storms of that winter season. Somebody here right now, you, you can testify. I'm in a storm. And I need to hear a word from the Lord to help me make it through the storm that I'm in. I, I don't know what storm you're in. Maybe, maybe this morning your storm is a financial storm. It's a financial whirlwind thunderstorm. And all you're trying to do is make ends meet. And if they don't meet, at least you want them to wave at each other, you know. Trying to make it from the first of the month to the end of the month. And, and every month it's the same mathematical calculation. You ain't got enough. And there's a financial storm that erupts. What you need in the midst of that storm is the pastor to preach you through that financial storm. Maybe this morning your storm is a health storm. Yeah. Well, you have to deal with varying health issues oh, yeah. in your body. Things just ain't working how they used to work. Well, all right. There's a, a, a discovery by the doctor. There's a prognosis and a diagnosis. And now the pastor has to preach you through the health storm of your life. Maybe this morning it's a, it's a marital storm. Where the wine glass of your marriage that used to be full of excitement and vibrancy has all been poured out. The thrill is gone and it ain't going to make no U-turn to come back. Pastor has to preach you through those types of storms. Maybe yours is a relational storm in a relationship with a significant other and, and things just always start out good but they don't stay good. They, they don't call like they used to. They don't text back like they used to. Been a while since we had date night and, and the pastor has to preach you through relational storms. But maybe it's employment storms. Application after application. In the in-between phase between employment and unemployment. Uh, interview after interview. Resume after resume. And the pastor has to preach you through employment storms. But maybe, maybe yours is a job storm where, where you got a job but it's not fulfilling you. It's not giving you the satisfaction that you would want from your job and your career. Maybe there's a, a discontinuity between what you do and what you love to do. All right. Increasing tasks on the job without increasing pay. All right. It's a job storm. Yeah. And you need the pastor to preach you through those types of storms. Maybe it's the storm of a loss of a loved one. Lord Jesus. Well, you're forced now to stand by the casket that's as long as love and as deep as life. My God. Now you've got to live life for the first time without the one who you thought would always be there. You need the pastor to remind you that whatever void is caused by the absence of that loved one, the Holy Spirit can fill with his presence. And so the pastor has to preach you through all types of storms. But I'm going to tell you something about storms. Storms, there's a benefit in storms. All right. And if you don't have a pastor to preach to you, you'll never see the real benefit of the storms of this life. On the mountaintops, life is good, but it's in the valley where you really grow. It's in the valley where God shows you that I'm the one who can keep you and hold you and sustain you in the midst of your storm. Saints used to say it like this, I thank God for my mountains. I thank God for my valleys. 
thank God for the storms he saw me through. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. You ought to thank God that you got a God who can keep you in the midst of your storm. You ought to thank God that in the midst of your storm, he may not take you out the storm, but he'll give you peace to handle the midst of the storm. Sometimes God doesn't always change things, but he will change you so you can handle the things that won't change. Let me say that again. That's a good Facebook post. Let me try it again. He won't always change things, but he will change you so you can handle the things that will not change. Thank God that he'll keep you in the midst of a storm. There he is. Whenever the Lord says peace, there will be peace. And so he, and so the pastor preacher, the wounded healer, preaches you through the winter storm season. But then, 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 not only does he preach you through the winter, he has to preach you through the spring. Spring season comes as winter gives way to spring. And it's the springtime where life is blossoming. Everything is going good and everything is going well. Winter time has given way to the springtime. Spring into new opportunities. Well, spring into new endeavors. Spring into new ventures, new relationships, new associations. It's well, the springtime. Life is good. Life is real good in the springtime. Yeah, it's good. You ain't had no problems out of that car in a few months. Life is good and cranked up every time you put the keys. This life is good. You got a little money in the bank. I almost said something right there, a little song. Shorty with strength. Life is good in the springtime. You got your boo thing and your boo thing got you. Life is, life is good in the springtime. But I tell you the danger of the springtime. It's easy to fall out of church in the springtime. Oh, yes, it is. Ain't no doubt about it. Life is good and you feel like uh, uh, everything's going good. I don't, I don't need to pray like I did in the winter. I don't got to show up to 6319 like I did when the storm was brewing. But you need the pastor, the wounded healer, to remind you that if God was good in the winter time, he's good in the springtime. You need him to remind you that the only reason you experience in the springtime now is because God is the one that kept you in the winter time. So he has to preach you through the spring times of life. Winter, spring, and then he has to preach you through the summertime. Summertime is that time in life when everything is just kind of going real smooth. Not too much. Yes, sir. Not too little. That's it. Everything just kind of sailing, just kind of regular. Regular. Just just regular. Just just everything is kind of chill and copacetic. That's it. And you need the pastor, preacher, the wounded healer in the summertime. Because one thing about the summer, it heats up in the summer. Temperatures start to rise in the summer. And if you're not careful, that heat in the summer will sneak up on you. You'll find yourself in a place with no covering. You need the pastor, the preacher, the wounded healer to on the one hand be a thermometer to test the degrees outside. But you need to be a thermostat to change the degrees that you're experiencing in your life. Winter, spring, summer, but finally he has to preach you through the fall. In season and out of season. And the fall is that time in life when everything around you is falling down. As soon as you get this straight, some mess up over here. As soon as you handle this, then you got to go over here and handle that. Yeah. Once you thought you done fixed this and taken care of that, unknowingly over here you got to go over here and handle that. It's the fall time when, when if it ain't one thing, it's another. Oh, it's always those times when life just kind of goes like that, just haywire. And in that period you need the preacher, the pastor, the wounded healer to preach you through those types of, of experiences. And so he says in season and out of season, but the pastor has to preach you through every season of life. But not only does the wounded healer preach you through every season, but the second thing we see in this text is the wounded healer has to preach to the wayward sinner. You didn't, you didn't close your Bible, did you? 
Yeah, please open your Bible. You're going to need to read it so you won't think I'm making it up. I'm in verse 2b now. I'm in the second part of verse 2. He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Let me unpack these three verbs that Paul gives to Timothy about some of the types of sermons he'll have to preach if he's going to be a good wounded healer. Sometimes you'll have to reprove. That, that word is uh, to bring to proof. Uh, to correct error by reason argument. That, that he has to use his reasoning, intellectual stability and acumen That's good. to reason sometimes with people. Uh, you have to you have to reason with people. Yep, that's good. And uh, you have to use your mind to communicate. All right. And correct seasoned error. He says, Paul. Paul says, Timothy, look. Sometimes you're gonna pass to them folk at that church. And there's gonna be a conflict that's gonna arise. And uh, you gotta be properly prepared to handle conflict resolution. You gotta be able to to reprove. Yeah. And so the idea is that you can't come to church All right. and leave your mind and intellectual acumen at the door. Right. That, that there ought to be an engagement not just with your head and your hands, but there ought to be an engagement with your mind. Many people feel like when you come to church, yeah. all they want to do is, is feel something. Ain't nothing wrong with feeling something. Yeah. But you don't just want to feel something, you want to know something about what you feel. And so he says you'll have to reason and use your intellectual acumen and stimuli to be able to reach the people. In addition to reproving, he says sometimes, Timothy, you're going to have to rebuke. You didn't, you didn't close your Bible, did you? It's right there in verse 2b. He says sometimes you're going to have to rebuke. That word means to chide, to chasten. That you have to rebuke a strained conscience whenever you see it appear. And sometimes as the preacher, pastor, the wounded healer, it's your job to make people uncomfortable in their sins. I knew you weren't gonna say amen. I just I, that's what the word means in the Greek. It, it means it means sometimes uh, you gotta make people a little uneasy in their sins. Uh, and, and, and he says when you do that, you gotta be careful how you do it. Because you're always. Last part of verse 2 says, with long suffering and patience. That to speak the truth is not enough. The truth has to be spoken in love. Because if you don't speak it in love, it's going to fall on deaf ears. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 6, but then in 1 Corinthians 13, he gives the autobiography of love. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and I can decipher all manners of mysteries and all types of tongues and prophecies, but I have not love, I'm nothing more than sounding brass and tingling cymbal. You can't just speak the truth. You got to do it in love. So he has to reprove and rebuke, but finally he has to encourage. I'm still in 2B now. He said, there's sometimes when you'll walk into church and your eyes will be filled with tears and your head will be hanging down and you need the pastor, the wounded healer to speak a word into your life that will lift up your bow down here and wipe the tears from your eyes. Some of you here this morning, you, you can testify. There have been times you walked in this church pulling whatever hair you got up there. And you walked in stressing about this, complaining about that, worried about this, panicking about that. But by the time the preacher stood up and opened the word of God and said, turn with me and this is the word of the Lord. Something stirred on the inside of you. And when you walked out, you had a new joy in your spirit because the word of God brings life. And the preacher sometimes has to encourage you. Let, let me show you how important preaching is. Preaching is essential. There's a story that's told about a man who jumped on the Miami bus station, on the Greyhound bus at the bus station. And he jumped on the bus and he took his gun out and put his gun up to the temple of the bus driver. And he told the bus driver, I want you to take me to Pensacola, Florida, or I'll shoot you. The bus driver was nervous. The people on the bus who had boarded were all nervous, hiding behind the seats. And after a few moments of dealing with this crazed gun, a woman named Edna Guy, who was a member of the Baptist Church in Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. She did one thing that changed the whole situation. She stood up and started preaching. That's all she did. She just, she just started preaching. This is a true story. You can verify. 
She just started preaching, and as she started preaching, after the next several minutes of her preaching, something happened, and the man's hand went limp. And the gun slipped out of his fingers. And the authorities were able to come on the bus and take him off because the word of God is powerful and it's quick and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I, I still believe that preaching is essential to the Christian church. I'm with P.T. Forsyth. They said that Christianity rises and falls with preaching. You, you, need, you need a preacher to preach to you sometimes as a way with sin. I'm almost done. On the one hand, the preacher preaches in every season of life. Preaches the word to every season. He preaches the word to wayward sinners. But thirdly, he preaches the word to wandering sensibilities. I'm almost done, but I'm in verses number three and four now. And I'm going to have fun with this whether you want me to or not. (laughs) For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, uh-huh. they will call around themselves preachers who will preach what they want to hear. Yeah, and will heap up for themselves and turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to faith. Uh-huh. Paul now outlines in a few verses that follow the danger of spiritual wandering. He foresaw a day when it would come up that people would no longer want to hear sound doctrine. They would call around themselves people who would preach to their itching, tingling ears sensations. He says, he says, they won't be able to put up with, they won't be able to handle sound doctrine. And so on the one hand, he says, the first danger is they they can't put up with sound doctrine. It's like like the scene from uh, A Few Good Men, one of my favorite movies. Tom Hanks is badgering Jack Nicholson on the witness stand about something that happened in the military barracks. And he asked him plainly in one of the most famous classic lines of American movies. He says, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. I see y'all seen the movie too. That's exactly what Paul is talking about in verse number three and four. That the time is going to come when folk, they just ain't going to be able to handle it. The truth of God's word. He said, Timothy, you got to keep on preaching. Even though they don't want to hear sound doctrine. But then he says, what they're going to do is they're going to call around themselves people. All right. Who are going to preach only what they want to hear. That they're going to preach to the tickling, itching sensations of their ears. Now, I'm still in verse number three or four if you ain't close your Bible. You got to be careful uh, with that type of preacher that preaches what people want to hear. Yeah. It's light. Uh-huh. It's trite. Uh-huh. It looks good, sounds good, but it ain't going to fill you up. Uh-huh. Amen. He, he, says, he says, be careful, be careful, be careful, be yeah. careful. Because people will try to preach uh-huh. what they think you want to hear. Let me tell you a story and I'll go to the next movie. I was in a college at Prairie View singing in the Baptist Student Movement Gospel Choir. Oh, yeah. And uh, that great university, that great, that yes. great university. Yes. Yeah. We had went to go sing at some church and there was a, there was a preacher there oh, who, wanted, who wanted to speak a word of prophecy in, into my life. And I, I do believe in the gift of prophecy. I just, I believe in it when it's authentic. It has to be All authentic. Right. And uh, I, I think that God does give that gift. Uh, it just has to be authentic. And so this, this preacher, he was going gonna, gonna to prophesy to me. And I was like, yeah, I'm all for that. Go ahead. And, and he started speaking. And he said, he said, I see a car. Oh, God, on today. I see a car. I see a, I see a car. God's showing me a car. Yeah. I see a car. He looked talking to me. I, I, see, I don't know why I see a car. I, can, I see a car in my spirit. I, I see a car. I see a, I see, I see, I see a car. I, I, I'm just, God is saying car, car. He says, <laughs> Uh, have you been praying for a car? Oh God! And I said, No. <laughs> I got a car. Good on gas mileage. No car, no. You know, you know. I, get me from A to B. I ain't got no. I, no, I ain't been praying for no. Are you sure you ain't been praying for no car? God is telling me, uh, uh, He's gonna bring. It's, it's a car. I, I said, well, no, that ain't, that ain't what I've been praying for. You can help me with this tuition. Did God say anything about tuition? Did he say anything about that? And he was trying to give me a word that he thought yeah. I wanted to hear. Yeah. 
And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. You got to be careful with these preachers who try to preach to your tickling ears sensation. And you got to be careful flocking to these churches that only preach what you want to hear. And then finally he says, he says, be careful. You got to be careful because all preaching is not healthy preaching. You ought to be glad you got a pastor that every Sunday stands up, opens the Bible, and says, turn with me and don't close that thing because everything I say is going to come right from the word. That's, that's what's called sound doctrine. You got to be careful. You got to be careful because there's some preaching that looks good on the surface, but beneath the surface, it will destroy you. Jim Bush in 2013 was a man who lived in Miami, Florida, and he was the victim of a catastrophic sinkhole at his home one morning he was going to make breakfast and he walked through the living room and stepped on his carpet and fell right through the floor he was the victim of one of the most dangerous occurrences in Miami Florida besides earthquakes and that's a sinkhole there was a sinkhole over time that had been forming in his living room that he knew nothing about sinkholes are the results to where what appears strong and sturdy on the surface, underneath the surface, actually has no weight and no depth. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy, and I'm telling you, you got to be careful with sinkhole preaching. There's a lot of sinkhole preaching going on that looks good on the surface. It, it tastes good, it smells good, it even sounds good, but underneath the surface, there's no depth to it, there's no meat to it, and it ain't gonna fill you up. You gotta be careful not to fall victim to sinkhole preaching. You gotta be careful because it might look good on the surface, but if it ain't rooted and grounded in the word of God, it's unhealthy preaching. I, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word in every season. He tells them, preach to wayward sinners, verse 2. He tells them, preach to wandering sensibilities, verse 3 and 4. But finally, in verse 5 and 6, he says, preach as a wounded sufferer. I I'm done. I'm done. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions as an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I, I got to confess, I've been trying to get to verse 5 and 6 all morning long. He says, in addition to all of that, you got to preach sometimes as a wounded sufferer. He's saying you have to endure affliction yourself, but you can't let the affliction that you endure stop you from doing the work of the ministry. Amen. He says, sometimes you're going to be called to be an agent of healing. And there'll be times when God is calling you to be that agent of healing, but you'll be wounded yourself and in need of healing. And he says the only way that you are going to be healed is that you have to lean on the one who is all of ours ultimate wounded healer. You got to lean on Jesus who himself is the perfect embodiment of the wounded healer. And the way it works is, as Paul says, I'm being poured out. That word is spindomite. It means I'm being expunged. I'm pouring myself out constantly for the needs of the people. It's the image of a libation offering that's poured on the sacrifice. Expensive oil and wine that's being expended and poured out. Paul says in the same way that this expensive libation offering is being poured out. So as the pastor, you got to be poured out. You got to always pour yourself out for the life of somebody else. But the only reason you can pour out of yourself into someone else is because Jesus has poured himself into you. That, that's all I've been trying to say. That, that, that's the whole idea of the wounded healer. That as he pours himself out and pours out of himself into you, Christ, the ultimate wounded healer, pours into him. Let me help those of you who are members of this church this morning. And give you some uh, final helpful holy hints of how you can help the pastor. Every member of the church ought to this morning make up their mind to on the one hand always pray for the pastor. Talk about this on Tuesday night. I gave us detailed descriptions about what we ought to be praying for, for the pastor. Many of y'all missed it. You can get the notes from whoever was here. But, but you got to pray for the pastor Shake his hand, encourage him, email, text, call, a note of encouragement. Why? Because every time 
that the pastor stands up to preach. Yeah. There's a little death in him at that very moment. All right. That's what Paul means when he says, I'm being poured out. That there's a little death that he experiences from constantly pouring himself out yeah. into the lives of those he leads. Yeah. Right. And, so, and so you do it. Why? Because Christ has poured into us. And so he says, we're not in ministry for what we're going to get from you. I want you to hear me this morning. No, don't, let, don't let the Creflo Dollar phenomenon fool you. We're not in ministry for what we're going to get from you. We're in ministry for what we're going to give to you. And he says, we gave you something. We gave you something that you can't purchase over the counter. The wounded healer always gives you what you can't use your currency to buy. And that is he gives you the life that God has given to him. And so here it is as I take my seat. Christ is the ultimate wounded healer. Who was wounded and heals us. And then as Christ pours into the pastor. The pastor pours out into the people. And the only reason the pastor is able to pour out into you. Is because Christ has poured into him. My pastor tells this story. Dr. West does of a man named Lee R. Scarborough who was the second president of Southwestern Seminary and he used to live in East Baptist Texas State University and there is a chapel named after him and one of his nephews. Years ago before Lee R. Scarborough became the president of Southwestern he took his son or his brother's son and his brother went out on a hunting excursion in West Texas. Scarborough's brother and his nephew went out and they caught their game. And after they caught their game, they put their hunt catch in the back of a truck and headed back to the farmhouse. And on their way back to the farmhouse, the truck hit a pothole and dislodged a 12-gauge shotgun and the bits of the buckshots blew from the back of the truck into the boy's head. He started bleeding. He would have died. It's a true story. You can verify it. It got him back to the farmhouse and his daddy cleared off the table and laid young Scarborough on the table. And they said, somebody need to go get the county doctor. It just so happened that the doctor was in reach. And the doctor got there and assessed the situation. He said, the only way that young Scarborough is going to live is that we're going to have to give to him a living blood transfusion. He said, we don't have any other utensils. All of the materials are back at the office. We're going to have to make everything up. So they started looking around the house for utensils to use for this living blood transfusion. And they took little holes and little needles. And they put a needle in the arm of the father. Took little holes and little needles and they put a needle in the arm of his son. And while that doctor was working on the back of that boy's head, the blood from the father was giving life to his son. And the more he kept on working on him, uh, the blood just kept on flowing. Uh, and the blood uh, was being poured out uh, from the arm of the father uh, into the arm of his son. Uh, and it kept on flowing and until the doctor was finally able uh, to heal that boy's wounds. Uh, bye bye now church. Uh, you put up with me for 28 minutes. Uh, but all I've been trying to tell somebody is, uh, is that the pastor uh, is a living uh, blood transfusion. Uh, and every time uh, he stands up to preach the word of God, uh, there's a little death in his life uh, and a little life in your life. Uh, but you ought to thank the Lord uh, that the pastor is able uh, to pour himself out into you uh, because Jesus has poured into him. Uh, bye bye. Now, church, uh, you've been mighty kind, uh, and I've held you too long. Uh, but we ought to all thank the Lord uh, because Jesus is the wounded healer. Uh, he was wounded uh, for my transgressions, uh, bruised for my iniquities, uh, and with his stripes, uh, I've been healed. Uh, and I need to tell you this morning uh, the only reason uh, I can pour out into you uh, is because Jesus has poured into me. Uh, and all I want the Lord to do uh, is pour out uh, a little more joy so I can pour in uh, some joy into you. Uh, pour out uh, a little more peace uh, so I can pour in uh, a little peace to you. Uh, pour out uh, a little more faith uh, so I can pour out uh, some faith to you. Uh, pour out uh, your power so I can pour in your life. I'm out of here this morning, but I like what the saints said. They said, wounded for me, wounded for me.
wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. God, my transgressions, and now I am free. Because Jesus was wounded for me. Dying for me. He's dying for me. There on the cross, he's dying for me. All my transgressions, and now I am free. Because Jesus was dying for me. 